Hello, and welcome to the Body House Chronicles. Here, we're chronicling the fringe industries of sex, cannabis, and psychics, the trades of real internet innovation in these phenomenal and turbulent times. This is Diane Bridges, and you're listening to another installment of the Body House Chronicles. Hello, this is Diane Bridges of The Body House, and today I'm talking with author Lola Davina, who has a new book out called Thriving in Sex Work, Heartfelt Advice for Staying Sane in the Industry. I'd love to hear what you think, you know, your general impressions of of your male clients. Anything you'd like to say about that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Um... Let me just give a little bit of runway right here. I've been out of the business now for 12 years, but I started when I was 22 and I'm about to be 49. So I've, I've had a lot of time to think about this. You know, I, I you know, uh, and the, the perspective that I have now looking back is that if I, if I had advice for clients, if I, if I had something that I wanted to say to the clients who were calling me, calling anybody, right? Is, is just yep. one word, and that is empathy, right? So mm-hmm. I, I try to put myself in the mind of a client, right? Because what is a client doing when he calls, right? He's horny. Mm-hmm. He wants connection. He's lonely. He's bored. He wants something to happen, right? And he sees right. an ad, and this person is attractive, and, they, you know, whatever it is, on whatever level that they're, you know, visually connecting or they like the words that they see, Right price range, right geographical area, everything, you know. So all that, all these things are, are are working, right? But but the but the desire, right, is I'm going to pick up the phone and I want this person on the other end of of the line to give me something that I'm looking for, which is sexual, it's emotional, it's physical, it's it's filling my time, it's filling my my mind with with fantasies, and I I, I you know I want this happy ending, right? And more than more mm-hmm. than in all, in all the meanings of the word. The human being on the other side of that phone line is there to give you what you want. But the, the empathy piece of it is you do not know what kind of garbage they have gotten already today, right? right. Um, mm-hmm. that, that when you, as a sex worker, if you put yourself out there, if you advertise, if you, if you display yourself, if you show your body, if you say, I am available, there are a lot of people who just take that as an invitation to be really horrible, and jerky mm-hmm. and rude. And as sex workers, yeah. we're constantly battling just this, you know, just people wanting stuff from us. They want it for free. They want to harass us. Yeah. They want to make us feel bad about ourselves. They want to make us feel guilty. Yeah. All these agendas. So you might be the real, you might be the target guy. You might be the really perfect guy, right? You know, you've got your money in hand and you're there to have a good time. And it's just, but you got to understand that the person on the other side of that line, that that person that you're calling to make your your fantasy come true, has to be guarded, you know, because that it, yeah. it's too bad that it has to be that way, you know. And it's, so, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, isn't it stunning? It's so true. They don't seem to understand that that is an absolute necessity, and then they get, uh, you know, they get so offended when we seem just a little bit standoffish, even the tiniest bit. Sorry, I jumped in, but no, no, it's it's just it's just so funny because yeah, again, I just think from the position of a client, it's like okay, I'm horny, I I want this person on the other side of the line to give me what I want. Well, of course you do, but just just that little that that little that little understanding piece of it, just to say like, okay, you might literally be the fortieth person this person has talked to today, mm-hmm. and you have no idea what garbage that person has had to, to deal with before they get to you. So um, I just, I would love for that empathy to be there. Um, obviously not every client is going to be capable of that, right? A lot of people just aren't, they just, That's they aren't true. curious and they don't care. But um, if true. you're a client out there and you're thinking like, how do I get what I want? You know, what, you know, how do I, um, how do I get that happy ending? The, the very first thing I would just say is, is if you could just think about, understand that that provider on the other end of the line has probably gotten a lot of hostility 
you know, just people trying to, to talk down their rates, people calling them up right. and trying to talk them into finding Jesus. You don't, you know, do <laughs> un, you know, phone sex. You don't know what that person's right. had to deal with today. So just having a little bit of empathy, that, uh, that I think is really important. Yeah, I I think that's an excellent point. Um, I, I it makes me think of um, I got a lot more savvy about how to screen people over the phone mm-hmm. so that I I mm-hmm. could control better who came in and what kind of experience that I would have uh, with my clients. And and I'm a hands only uh, massage mm-hmm. therapist, so my service is, is I know it's on the the tamer side of uh, the sex work industry, but it's you know it's still. People, you know, call me for the same, uh, you know, happy ending reason. Um, mm-hmm. What I've noticed is that a lot of the good ones, and I'm fortunate that I do get a lot of good ones, they seem to have to make up a lot of slack for other guys in their gender who, as you've just stated, um, have no empathy and are are really looking out for themselves. Um, I guess what I'm looking for is... Maybe talk about a little bit about your screening process and what made a good client and a good experience mm. with you, with your male clients. I think that may sure. may help. Insight. Yep. Okay. Sure. Um, well, like I, 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 I was thinking just as soon as you said that, that it took time to develop. Um, I, I certainly know um, that when I first started out, uh, I was much more insecure, and mm-hmm. I kind of felt like if somebody picked me, I had I had to say yes. Um, mm-hmm. I was just I just had a lot less discretion, and it's so it's funny to think about like when I was in my early twenties, and you know, I not to boast, but you know, I was you know I was a hot little property, right? Um, right. But I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And when I, you know, was working in my 30s, what, you know, I, I, you know, I was in my 30s. I was, you know, older. I just had so much more of a sense of myself. And that um, if, you know, I, I took the, I just sort of took myself and the job more seriously. Um, I knew that if I, if I let a jerk in, um, that could mm-hmm. that could throw off my game for a week. Um, wow, you know, if I, I knew that, oh well, I you just just I'd be you know fearful, I'd be agitated, I'd you know that just that feeling of like if I had a bad client, yeah, I mean that could throw me off, you know, le- you know, I'm lying awake at night with an upset stomach. I mean, you could just you know be afraid every time the phone rang. I mean, that feeling of like if somebody really gets to you, that can, that can okay, throw you, this you off is your very stride. Important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know what? This is very, very, very important. I actually think what you've just described permeates women everywhere. That's not just a sex worker worker problem. I think women everywhere in every culture, whether they ever, you know, set foot in the sex work world, which most don't, I think all of us have had some type of experience like that. If you mm-hmm. would be willing, could you expand on how you got to that point? What it, what was it about that particular experience that left you, that rattled for a week? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, okay, I could just say, uh, you know, and I was fortunate that it didn't happen very often. Um, I, had, I had one experience where I had a, a client who was a repeat client. I had seen him before. So mm-hmm. there was all, you know, so there was a level of, I mean, not like, fantastic trust i mean maybe it was the second or third time i saw him but i mean he was a known entity right and i believe looking back on it at the time it wasn't clear to me it was only after talking to other people after it happened he was probably high he he was probably done Um, like some meth or some cocaine or something um not enough to like be super obvious to me but um he 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 started doing things and and he was hurting me you know he was kind of like being too rough and i you know a couple Mm -hmm. of times i said you know you know, you're too rough. You're hurting me. And then he, then he like, he like bit me. He bit my, he bit my breast. And I mean, enough Ooh. to hurt me, enough to make me jump. And when I, when I jumped and said something about it, he started laughing. Oh. And I freaked the fuck out. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean. I pardon my French, but I mean, chill down my <laughs> spine. Like, 
I'm not, yeah. okay, is, do I have Hannibal Lecter in my apartment? This is not cool. So right. I got him out. He was furious. He slammed the door. He shouted in the hallway. Really? So, of course, you know, all the fear that I had around my neighbors finding out and everything, I, like, immediately, like, got all the money out of the house, went to a friend's house, took my ad down. Like, I went to ground, like, to the mattresses for, like, a week. Wow. And, um, the one, the one piece out of that, I mean, I think I probably overreacted. I mean, I never heard from him again. I never had any, I, I didn't like move out of my apartment for a week, but I, I just didn't work for a week. I didn't answer my phone. Um, but, but it was interesting, the people that I stayed with, I was, you know, talk, telling them what had happened, obviously, because I was so upset. And, and, and uh, one of them, one of my friends said, you know, Lola, when, when, I, when I do something wrong, and I'm embarrassed. Sometimes I laugh inappropriately. That might have just been, he, he might have just been like a nervous laughter. Like he, I, and, you know, I'm, I'm not. Can I ask if that, guy he, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Lola, can I ask if that friend was a man or a woman? It was a man. It was a man. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> but it was just, I mean, it just, it's, listen, I, I'll never really know what was going through that guy's mind, right? I, I don't, it was just, it was just like, it was one of those, it was one of those aha moments where I could kind of, see things from a different standpoint like oh my god i had a serial killer in my house as opposed to okay maybe i had a guy who was a little bit high and and not behaving well and then he you know fucked up and 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 kind of laughed inappropriately um anyway i i don't really know so i you know it's just it was just one of those stories where it's like it was bad it felt terrible at the time obviously i got through it you know what i'd love well, to let me no, I well, I was just going to say, episodes like that, though, you know, kind of to get back to my first point, forced me to take my job really seriously. And like I say, the screening process really seriously. And, and I was actually going to offer some advice around that if you want it. But if, if you have another question, I'd ha- be happy to answer that. Um, yeah, I, this is um, certainly personally... Um, uh, we could discuss some stuff later, but I, I'm really, I, I want guys to understand this because I really think you hit on such an important point with that client and that story. Um, you're now, you say you're now 12 years retired. You're now in your mm-hmm. late forties. And, mm-hmm. um, so you've got some distance from it. Approximately how old were you at the time when that, ha- that story happened? When that, when that story happened, which is, I, I'm going to Say was the scariest thing that that I ever had to deal with. I had, I mean, another kind of icky thing. So that was the only time I really like, like, like the like the chill, like, mm-hmm. oh my fucking yep. god, like, how do I get right. this psycho out of my apartment feeling? Uh, I would have said I was thirty three. I was I was thirty three, and I was just back. I was just back. Um, I, I so I I worked in my, I worked in the sex industry in my early twenties. I, I went away from it for seven years, and then I worked again in my in my thirties. So, and I had just been oh, back. Okay. I would say less than less than a year. So, I, so it's kind of like this weird thing where I was like new at it, but I had also had this past experience. Um, so, kind of an in between kind of place. I don't know. Is that helpful? Knowing how old I was? Uh, yeah, I just um, it's just that you know you you ended off the story saying you're still not really sure what was going on with him. And I just find that interesting with so so far removed from it that there still seems to be something um unsure uh, about uh, about where you were um and I think this is really important for men to know that women so much of us wants to give men the benefit of the doubt, and right. I think oftentimes men take that for granted in the worst ways, and I think that story actually. Uh, speaks to that and um there's i've often found and i've heard this from other women there's i don't know almost a sense of ownership from men and or entitlement like somehow whether it's you know biblical or not but that somehow a lot of men have the sense that we are here for them and it whether that guy was high or not i think it does speak to his psychology in in a deep way the fact that he could he could hurt you, and you could tell him that several times. And then when he really hurts you, he ends up laughing. And then when you finally kick him out, he gets pissed off. Mm-hmm. And there's right. something about that that is, I think, universal. I also think it's reflected in our current president elect, <laughs> but um, <laughs> which is part, <laughs> which yeah, is part of what I well, write about, and, and that. I kind of feel. 
maybe, I don't know, maybe we can go into that as well, but um, because I just think this is such an important issue. Men just don't seem to get it. But a story like that, whether you're a sex worker or not, I think is infinitely relatable for any woman on the planet, whether she's had something like that happen to them or not. Um, yeah. It, yeah. And so I, I really appreciate you sharing. And for the guys who are going to be listening to this, um, I hope that they recognize some of themselves in that, even if they've never done anything like that. I really do think there's something about that way of thinking, that sort of justification of their own behavior to kind of take their frustrations out on us and we should just kind of go along with it because so many guys don't seem to have that and they seem to be blind to it. So, yeah. Oh, sure. No, I mean, I, I, I mean, I agree. I agree up to a. I mean, I, I agree up to a point. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't universalize it, but I, but um, you certainly see a, enough of it. And if I, if I may be so um, down to earth, um, when guys get aroused, there's another kind of level of I want what I want, and I yeah. want it now, and I'm paying for it. Um, right. So there's that. Um, and, you know, that I just know as a sex worker that it's like that always has to be managed, right? When somebody's aroused, they, they, they're, it's, it's now we're not just talking about their heads. We're talking about their entire physiognomy. Everything is kind of moving towards this singular goal um, right. of getting off. And um, I think a lot, of, a lot of men, like you point out, a lot of clients, they want, they want to get off. And mm-hmm. um, it's especially when you're paying for it, there's that feeling of that's what you should do for me, regardless of right. how it feels or, you know, just, that's just kind of your job. The job is to get me off. Um, right. And, of course, as Fair sex enough. workers, we put ourselves in that position. <laughs> I mean, that is indeed what we're signed up yeah. for. But there just has yeah. to be, again, I would come back to this word empathy, the sense of the sex, the sex worker is a human being. The sex worker has needs and feelings and, you know, and is there to accommodate you up to a point, but is, but it's not a robot or an object. Okay. Um, and so that kind of leads me into this next. I love that word empathy that you're using. Um, and um, I, I, I come back to um, the current president-elect because personally, I, every day I'm a little bit horrified with what I see in the news. And the word empathy, I think, uh, applies so well to our uh, current administration and, and the outgoing administration. I think President Obama and Vice President Biden, I think, have really in, have embodied empathy in many ways as men. And I'm yeah. unsettled, and I think, like many, that we don't see much of that in the current president-elect. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think he who shall not be named um, is a walking <laughs> advertisement for male entitlement and, and yeah. lack of empathy. And he seems... And it's, it's been really painful on a lot of levels. I think... Uh, those of us who believe that empathy is really, what can I say? It's the only way we're all going to be able to live on this earth together, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's the only way that we can, it's the only way that we can connect and, and survive. Um, and the, the empathy narrative is one that many of us imp- try to impress on our on children, right? I mean, I certainly knew when I was growing up, I mean, I was told you don't laugh at handicapped people. You don't, you're mm-hmm. nice to people who are different. Um, you know, there was a horrible history in this country where, you know, white people own black people. That was a terrible mm-hmm. time. And, you know, you know, we need to find the humanity in everybody. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. the things that happened during World War II were terrible. Like, you know, like these, these ideas are instilled in us and they're instilled in, in school and they're instilled in art and they're instilled in like documentaries. And like, there are many, many, many ways that these messages permeate our culture. And -hmm. then when something like our president elect comes along, we're reminded because if you're soaked in that, you think like, well, that's, that's how, that's how people should behave. You need, it's, it's a wake up call and it's a reminder to realize that there are plenty of people who don't think that way. Yeah. And that there's a very, there is a, a, a real, um, uh, how should I say, like, there's a real drive to power. There's a real, there's a, there's a, there are people who, who want domination. They, they want force. They want intimidation. They want punishment. Um, 
they want to be on the side of the, you know, it's like they want to, how can I say, they want to cozy up to the person who's doing all that, right? Where they want to be on the, on the side of, of might, because um, that makes them feel safe. Um, but what gets mm. lost is that, is, that, is that sense of, you know, everyone has a right to, to live and be free and not be afraid. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, I I see we are in we are we're in for a um, a textbook lesson in what non empathy looks like for the next four years, um, mm-hmm. and we'll we'll really get a chance to say, wow, I don't like how that looks. I don't like how that feels. I don't want to mm-hmm. be that person. Somebody was mm-hmm. this is you know somebody was saying that you know the the depth of our heartbreak around this election points to what our values are. Points to what we love um, and what we what we hold dear, you know. So and can I you like say that one more time? Did, did you say the depth of our heartbreak is, is mm-hmm. uh, in this? Can you yeah, just reiterate that? I just want to make yeah. sure that I, I got that. Yeah, the, the the depth to which we are find our, finding ourselves heartbroken over this person points to the things that we hold, the things that we treasure the most. Right. Mm. I, I mm. really, really value a man who respects women. That's yeah. really important to me. Amen. Um, Amen. So when I see someone like this guy come along, you know, and I just find myself repulsed. It, I mean, one gift of that, I mean, again, it's, it's repulsive. I can feel my, my body like physically just I could feel myself you know, yeah. getting almost like nauseous. I can get so upset. But I just think like at least the gift of that is reminding me. It's really important. It's a it's a value for me that men respect women. Um, yes. It's a value for me that able-bodied people are not cruel to people who ha- are differently abled. Like, can we just draw some bright lines? Can I just get an amen? Um, so he, you know, he he is a message. He's he's sending that message to me. He's reminding me every day of what I think is important. Unfortunately, it's in the negative, not like. Not like Obama, not with the way that he, not the way that he carries himself in the world. But right. anyway. Okay. Wow, that's intense. Um, let me just ask one more question. Um, in light of that, uh, as a woman um, in the sex work industry and beyond, uh, how what sort of information or suggestions would you have uh, for other women in terms of? helping them find a, a man who is respectful of women. Are you talking, are you talking about like clients, relationship? Clients, okay. Yeah, whether well, it's a uh, relationship or clients. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay, well, um, well, so, so, so I've, been, I've, been, I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, in terms of, I mean, just, I'm just going to talk about clients because I think that that's like a nice, I don't know, that's kind of a, a concrete piece, right? Like I can break that off and I can talk about that as a concrete thing rather than kind of like the whole global thing. But um, my, I did this to a certain extent, but I wish I had done it more. I mean, looking back, if I, if I had some advice for myself when I was younger, this is the advice that I would give. I would sit down and I would write out what all my rules are, all the things that really are important to me. And that can be good rules and bad rules. Like I really like a client who I can tell from the first minute from talking to him on the phone, that I know he likes himself. Not not like crazy, pumped up, you know, braggy, but like, you know, the kind of whiny guys who don't like themselves, they're a pain in the ass. Okay, like, so, like, my <laughs> ideal client. You know, I, I want a guy who, like, likes himself. Or who, right. who maybe it's, I, I know that he likes me, right? I can tell from a minute or so talking on the phone. I can just feel that feeling right off, off the bat. He likes me. You know, that he there's something about mm. He's he's warming up to me. Maybe that's some some like on some base level. I just feel like that that generates trust in me, right? Or maybe it's like okay. if I set a rule, like call me back at 10 a.m. They call uh, me right back at 10 a.m. Whatever it yes. is. I mean, so it can be like these concrete rules. It can be these yes. these kind of amorphous things. And then what I would do is set. So write all that down so you know what your rules are, right? Really have it, visu- you know, like visualize. And what, you know, this is the good stuff. This is the, the bad stuff. And then mm-hmm. I would post my rules really plainly. I mean, something like, you know, I like guys who like themselves. Maybe I would just keep, I would tuck that to myself. But, you know, call me, you know, when I, when I propose a callback time, honor that. Um, if I say, 
bring my donation in an envelope and leave it on my little side table when you first walk in the door, you know, write that down. Like, you know, I, I right. expect you to sh- you know, show up, you know, freshly sh- showered and having brushed your teeth. And if you haven't done that, you- you'll do that the minute you walk in the door. You know, whatever your rules are. And then post them and post them really plainly. Um, mm-hmm. I saw part of this was inspired because I was looking at this one escorts ad and, and her, um, I was looking at her submission form or her, or, you know, her form where she, uh, application, and maybe that's the best way to say it. Well, her thing mm-hmm. had all this stuff, but then if you filled it out, like there were pop-up windows. It's it, There were like five of them. And it was like, do you understand that we will meet, you know, at the agreed time? And you have to like check the box <laughs> and then hit next. Like it for, she forced you to like say, I yeah. understand like her five rules. Like don't break my fucking rules. Um, so, right. You know, that's pretty confident, right? I mean, I would say that, you know, you have to have a, you know, I'm not saying that everyone can do this, obviously. You you need to have a certain amount of clientele where you know if you're going to force people to jump through hoops, they're going to jump through them. But working towards that, right, that basically saying to the universe, I know what my ideal client looks like, and that's Mm -hmm. who I want to talk to. Um, Uh So that's the first thing. I would, I just really... And it does a bunch of things. It, it it gives clients a rule book. They know right. they. It's not like they you didn't tell them, right? They may not read it, but you're at least giving them the opportunity to to do it right the first time, right? Uh-huh. So that's my first thing that I think is really important. The second thing is is giving yourself permission to cut somebody off or to fire someone when they don't follow your rules. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, whether you have a, like a one strike policy or a two strike policy, like you say it, you, you say it nicely once. And then the second time you say you're done, but being mm-hmm. really clear about that and just saying like, if I'm going to do this work, those are my rules. Two strikes, you're out. I tell you, I tell you nicely the first time and I tell you we're done the second time or whatever it is. Well, however you, you know, maybe mm-hmm. you have a one strike rule. Maybe you have a three strike rule, whatever you feel comfortable with, but you know what your rules are. And it's like, and like down, like deep in your gut, like, in, you know, your solar plexus, you say, it's really okay for me to have those rules. I'm really fine with yes. it. Those are my rules. Yeah. And it's okay for me to enforce them. Because the third piece of it then to me is then don't look back. Don't feel guilty. Don't beat yourself up. Mm-hmm. Once you enforce your rules, you know, right. don't, you know, that it, um, I used to feel guilty a lot. Um, I used yeah. to feel like, oh, my God, I hung up yeah. on that guy and that makes me such an asshole. Or maybe mm-hmm. if I just talked to him a little bit nicer or maybe he's having a really bad day, I'd beat myself up for hours. And it's like yeah, just just saying, you know, like, look, if you give clients the rules the first time, mm-hmm. you tell them nicely, you, you give them a chance. If you then have to pull the ripcord and cut them off, you're done. Like, you right. like don't 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 feel guilty. Don't get mad. Don't don't stay mad for hours later. Just say that guy's a jerk. Right. We're done. Right. You know, on to the next. I'm not going to let this right. guy ruin my day. So, um, <laughs> I guess that would be because I, I also feel like, and I also feel, and I know you're really concerned about you know educating clients, and I think that's such a you know you're doing you're doing the world a service. I mean, really, you're doing. Really, you're doing fantastic work. This also has kind of the ancillary or, or, you know, secondary benefit of training clients that if you follow the rules, you get what you want. And if you don't, you don't get what you want. So, hey, wouldn't it just be easier if you follow the rules? Um, Right. It spills over into their personal life, too, don't don't you think? Yeah, no, I think I do. And I think part of it is is that – if your if your business plan, which and I, I say this because this was my business plan for years, so I'm I'm certainly not shaming anybody else. I listen. This, mm-hmm. this is what my my business plan is. I'm just going to be nice to everybody and hope that they're nice back. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that if people if I'm really nice to people, they'll be nice in return. That'll be that. <laughs> that's my hope. That's my wish. Right. And uh, you, mm-hmm. you you talk about gender roles. I think that is a very feminine worldview. Yes. Um, yes. But I'm, but I, what I would, again, say from, from this position of, of having some distance, you're not hurting anybody's feelings and you're not being an asshole by just simply, simply stating what your rules are, you know? That's true. Like, instead of saying, 
I'm just going to hope that everyone's nice to me. I'm just going to say instead, these are the things that I need in order to be comfortable. And I'm going to ask you to follow them. And if you can't, that's fine. But I just won't see you. Right? It's just, it's just. Yes, I, that's true. And you know, why does it take us so long to get there? Because it it is true that that women do tend to, um, they want to treat everybody nicely, and they kind of expect they're going to be treated nicely in in return. Unfortunately, so many men, whether uh, they're dealing with a sex worker or not, want to keep pushing the boundaries. Can I get a little bit more? Can I get a little bit more? Can I get a little bit more? Yep. And then, yep. and it seems to take a long time for women, mostly because of our guilt, to get to the point where it's like, you know what, no is no, and I'm done feeling guilty, and you know, take it or leave it. And I'd rather if you just right. leave because you're now you're just irritating me. Why do you think that it takes so long for us to get to that point? Well, I I think we're socialized. I think we're socialized to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think like you know, as you you point out the the gender gender roles that you know women are expected. We're, we're, I mean, it's, it's not a coincidence that, you know, you and I both know what, I, what I'm talking about, that idea. If you're just nice, hopefully people will be nice in return. It's, it's a kind of soft power, right? It's, it's, um, it, it's saying I don't have the right, I don't, I, don't, I don't give myself the authority to state that I have rules. Um, we're just going to operate from a position where I'm just nice to everybody. Um, and you, 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 you hit on something that's really important, and, and I'm, I'm so glad because I, I don't want to forget this. this. This point is really important that when we operate, when that's our, when that's our, our model, when that's, mm-hmm. our, uh, that's, that's our framework, we have to get to the point where we get mad in order to yeah. defend ourselves, right? right. So <laughs> what I propose, yeah, and then you get mad, and then, you're, then you, know, you either feel guilty for getting mad. I'm so great at doing that. Oh, my God, I, I'm, I got mad. I'm such an asshole. I should have, like, right. diffused that situation or handled it better. Like, fuck that. Like, you know, that person's being yeah. a jerk. Um, so, so, again, getting back to my original point, if, 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 you, if you just kind of shift the paradigm and say, okay, I have rules. These are the rules that I need to keep me happy. I'm going to enforce my, my, my two strikes or my three strikes. And then I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be guilty. I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to beat myself up afterwards because I did all the work I needed to up front to let someone succeed. And if they chose not to succeed, then they failed on their terms. Um, right. It takes away that mechanism where it's like, okay, I'm going to try to be nice, be nice a little more drop my little cues, kind of let them know I'm getting a little bit mad. Oh, my God, now I'm fucking furious, and now I have to act like a jerk in order to get this person out of my life. Isn't it just better to say, okay, I told you once, and I'm afraid you just didn't hear me the first time, so I'm afraid we're done. I mean, isn't that, doesn't right. that feel better than getting really mad? Um, That's true. So yeah. um, anyway, I, I know it's a lot of upfront work, but I think the, the benefits that you pay, the, the payoffs on the back end, or you yes. can just just say I have listen I've I've I really have I I'm not I'm not hiding what I think you should do I'm telling right. you what I think you should do and if you do it <laughs> I will reward you but if you yes. choose not to we're not a good fit um, yes anyway, so that's my is, advice <laughs> that's, that's a my very advice great for getting through it that's a really great point, and men need to understand this, that when you listen to us the first time, especially when we've gotten to the point where we're able to express ourselves that way and set down a very clear boundary the first time you start to annoy us, that if you listen to us, we will reward you with a much better attitude. We will be so much sweeter. We will laugh much louder. We will smile more often if you listen to us the first time. It's, <laughs> guys, I, I'm, I'm always a little bit baffled that they seem so baffled that we don't react to them in the way that they want when they keep demanding that we behave in the way that they want to. And this is what I've been trying to tell guys. It's really quite simple. And, um, you know, especially with an older woman, it, you know, we've learned how to set those boundaries up front. And I'm still surprised that so many older men have not learned that if you listen to her up front first, that you'll get a much better response from her. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I'm so glad that you made that point. Wow, this has been really intense, much more intense than I thought, <laughs> but it's great. It's been great. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad. I'm, I enjoy talking to you. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it's something, I don't know how old you are, and I'm not going to ask, but I mean, I mean, I think there's just something when, when, when you've had a little bit of life experience, right, you can just, it gives you a little bit of distance, right? And it's clear that yes. you've spent a lot of time thinking about how these dynamics work and, yeah. you know, where... You know, this is the, this is the way that we were raised. I mean, I I think yeah. you know we're taught these gender roles before we even understand what speech is. I so yeah. it, it's you know it's not like you just kind of wave your magic wand and then everybody kind of gets it. I mean, it's it, it, it's really it is a process. Um, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think one of the one of the ways that one of the ways that we can change people is if we if we explain explain how they're like you say, being being able to see the see the pattern and explain it, and explain if you do it, you just if you do if you're just willing to make these little changes, you can have it be so much better for you. Yeah, <laughs> you will it be really rewarded. Is that simple. It's, yeah, yeah, it's the small small yeah. changes on a on a regular basis that will can make a huge difference. Yeah, I'm just yeah, I'm so glad that we yeah, I I just um if if i can get that across to guys that that come to see me that would be like the best that would be a, a huge thing so that would be awesome oh, um, you, would be, you so, would be my heroine well as i as i write i i was i was in and around the sex industry for more than 15 years i started when i was uh, in my early 20s stripping Graduated my way through domination and making porn, and finally ended up as an escort, which I did, which is where I stayed for for for. I, I had two stints, one in my early twenties, one in my early thirties, but it spanned about fifteen years. Um, I wrote this. What I always like to say is, I wrote this book as the book that I wished that I had had when I was working. Right. Um, and I know that sounds a little corny, but it's actually really the truth. I I, I found sex work to be incredibly emotional. Uh, I found it to be hard work. I liked it. I found it to be rewarding. But uh, when things went wrong, there weren't a lot of resources. There weren't a lot of places to turn. And also, I didn't see myself or the experiences that I had being reflected anywhere. Now, this is long before sex work Twitter and, you know, all the stuff online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's many, 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 many more people doing sex work and talking about sex work. Um, But at the same time, I still felt like my – I had – something to contribute. And uh, one of the things I say about this uh, is is that although there's incredible information to be found online, there's very, very, I I think that there's excellent advice to be found online. It's not all in one place. It's it's pretty different. It's dispersed pretty widely. Um, And one of the reasons to write the book for me was to concentrate all of my ideas in one place, all the all the best advice that I'd received over the years. And, uh, you know, I, I know you, you asked me, you know, at what point in my life did this, you know, did this, this book come about? I mean, I, mm-hmm. I felt like I really needed to be away from the industry for about 10 years in order to write this book. There, there were times when I was writing it when I was really like, Lola, I wish you had written this. I wish you had had the energy and the foresight to write this when you were still working because so much more of it, I, I might have felt more connected to the material in a way, you know what I'm saying? It might've felt more alive to me. Um, well, I don't know. It the... seemed, it was, a, you seem pretty connected. I gotta say it's, it's uh, remarkably well-written and uh, I certainly, oh. some of the stories that you share, the, the personal stories as well as uh, more objective advice jumped off the, the page. It's really an excellent read for anyone in oh, the good. sex work industry and, or thank anybody so curious much. about it. So thank yeah, you, you did a great well, job. Thank, oh, thank you. Well, and um, what I, part of the well, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that it connects, and obviously so much of it was still really vivid for me, and and obviously so much of it was stuff that I'm still churning and processing and thinking about, and um, you know, a decade later, um, and one of the things I like to say about the book, although I don't say it expressly in the book, and it's one of my few regrets about the book, I don't actually come right out and say this, but all of the advice that I give, and I, I mean, I could turn to any page at random, and I could point out to you. The reason why I took the time to sit down and write this is because it's in response to at some point in my life, I wasn't handling whatever this thing is well. I was beating myself up or I was letting myself down or I had bad information or um, 
I wasn't practicing like really good self care around something. Um, so in many ways, the book is actually a catalog of my mistakes, <laughs> but it's also um, the, what I hope the gift is in it is saying, look, you know, here I am a little bit later in life looking back and just saying, look, you know, th- you don't have to beat yourself up over this. You don't have to, you know, there, there are ways right. to get through this. Here, here are the strategies that I've learned. Here's the wisdom that, that I know now. Um, so that's, that's why I wrote the book. And, and yeah, just to have that, just, just to look back on, on things and just say, for my younger Lola and for all the little, you know, folks that are out there, you know, this is what I would tell you now. I may not have had the, okay. the, the ability, I may not have had the distance or the perspective to say it then, but I certainly do now. All right. So that kind of leads into the next question. Um, the body has the, my website is uh, definitely geared to men. And we, mm, yes. what I try and do is, yes. yeah, I try and give them an insight into the female mind, uh, as well as, uh, especially sex work, because it just seems mm-hmm. most every single man has had some sort of encounter with sex work, whether it's mm-hmm. from uh, body rubs all the way in between to, you know, escorting or gone to a stri- strip club or something like that. So, and or we're porn. also seeing, Can we just say porn? of course, of course, <laughs> I mean, porn. of course, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, porn. yes, of course, yeah. definitely. That's actually probably the simplest and easiest and quickest way to yeah. have any sort of contact yeah. with it. So having said all that, uh, I, I also want to connect this to what's happening in the news nowadays with all these high level uh, men coming out and, and being accused of sexual harassment. And uh, and now we're seeing consequences for that. So somebody like yourself, who's been in the industry for such a long time, having dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of clients, um, I want to hear your viewpoint on, you know, I, helping men become better men. Because if I'm hoping right. that if they're listening to this, they're, they're curious. They want to understand us better, which means mm-hmm. they want to re- communicate better. So how yeah. can they do that in, in light of what's happening today? That's a really interesting framing, Diane. And I, I, I just wanted to say I always appreciate the fact that you're always thinking about the sex industry as the two sides, right? Not just, right. The, not just the supply. You always mm-hmm. have that eye towards the demand. And I admire that. And, and I think that that's such an important message. It doesn't get out there enough. I mean, for all yeah. the churn and all of the interest, and all of the discussion around sex work, it 99% of it focuses on the people who are supplying services. Um, and there's reasons for that. I mean, obviously, we're sexy and we're fun and we're out there and we're professional exhibitionists. And, you know, there's reasons why, you know, you know the, the eye naturally uh, roves towards us. But the fact is, is that if you don't examine the flip side, it's right. just this huge shadow. It's just this huge sa- mm-hmm. shadow side where motivation and market forces and everything else is just sort of ignored. I mean, I would say that there is an interesting time for this idea that, and it's being, it's, it's certainly like you say, it's happening uh, very visibly with 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 these allegations of sexual harassment and bad behavior that, of course, we've all known have gone on for a long time. We may not know about any one particular individual, but we certainly know that people behave badly. We've known this for a long time. And then on this you know, this other side, this, you know, how the sex industry is ever so slowly inching towards becoming more and more normalized, becoming less and less shocking, more and more accepted. Um, and yeah, it, it is this, it is this um, psychic shift. It's this paradigm shift where we're, we're taking a look at sexuality and saying, look, people want to have sex. Mm-hmm. Um, right. <laughs> and, but because we don't, we still haven't trained, you know, people well about it. And you, you focus on men. I mean, both men and women, people of every gender, there's still a lot of shame around sex. There's still a lot of uh, blaming around sex. It's hard for people to articulate what they want. Sometimes, sometimes the exercise that I like to go through is just to think like, what, what if we lived in a shame-free world around sex? And what if, what if people could just have sex and just have that be accepted? It might still be something that you do behind closed doors, like going to the bathroom, but it's not, it, it's not a source of like self-hatred or um, shaming and blaming, right? It's just, True. Uh, true. Right. Although in terms of how it's being used and abused, um, uh, like we're seeing in the news, but also as a client who comes to, to pay for it, there may mm-hmm. shame may be part of it. But there also seems to be a, a large element of power 
connected to it mm-hmm. because a lot of, a lot of the men that are being accused of this tended to choose younger women who were starting in their careers they didn't go after the women who were on equal footing who ha- getting mm-hmm. equal pay and who were either uh, you know equal to them in, in position or above so right uh, and I that is actually reflected in the sex work industry that oftentimes clients think they have all the power. They're the ones paying. Um, and so uh, they think they're on top. And I think it seems to be sort of a general I, attitude towards women. Can you maybe speak to that? Because I think it's maybe shame can be used as a tool for power and feeling powerful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Got that. Well, I, I write about outsourcing shame. I mean, I think it's one of the, the it is a key dynamic right. in sex work. People want sex, they pay for it. And for whatever reason, maybe they feel they're feeling bad about it. Again, because the culture tells you that if you have to pay for sex, there's something wrong with you. Um, you're supposed to get it for free. So there, there might be there might be some guilt or shame there. And you know, the, that can result in bad behavior on the client's part. I think, right. but you, but power is important. So is entitlement, right? So is just the notion, the idea that I should be sexually sated. I should have, I should have sex with the people that I want. Um, I should uh, be able to have sex with the partners. You know, I, 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 I deserve to have as much sex as I want, as have as much variety as I want to have the, the kinds of the partners that look the way that I want them to and to act the way that I want them to. Um, right. Which I have to say, I don't. I don't go through life thinking that. <laughs> I don't. I don't. No, no. You know, the the people who do and the people who don't. I mean, there are some. There are some like broad categories there, right? You know, and, mm-hmm. and men mm-hmm. in general are taught over and over and over in society that they they should be able to have sex with who they want. They should be gratified the way that they want. They should, their partners should perform the sex acts that they want. Um, yeah. And. The rest of us, you know, live in a world where sex doesn't look like that or feel like that, and we don't think about sex that way. And that is, it's deep, it's very cultural. I, you know, I don't see that changing in one generation or, or maybe five generations, I think. It's going to take a long time for that to work its way through the system. But I do think we're, we're, there is more consciousness around it, right? Women are, women are certainly thinking about themselves as desiring beings, not just desirable beings, right? Women have, having mm-hmm. desire knowing what your desire is, being able to articulate it and enjoy it and not feel shamed for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, all True. of that, I think men, men take for granted. They, they don't, they don't even, they don't even have to think about that. Right. Culture right. Talking, that's fine no, for them. Yeah. I, I totally um, agree with you on that, but you mentioned in, I do remember reading that in your book, the outsourcing of shame, mm-hmm. which is, right. I think that's, uh, I don't, I've never heard that term before, but I think that's really interesting. Maybe we should hashtag it. <laughs> Um, so, um, but I've connected, I've made a little note here, outsourcing shame connected to powerlessness, a sense of powerlessness, as well as entitlement and ownership Mm -hmm. of women. And it does Mm -hmm. seem, there does seem to be something in men, you even get it on the street. And I've felt this, I'm sure you felt this. I've had other female friends talk about this, even standing on the street, waiting to cross the, the mm-hmm. when the light changes they'll get this look from a guy just mm-hmm. staring at her the only thing stopping him from just taking her is the social element and yeah. i you know this kind of goes into the next question here about um you mentioned that uh that you think there may be a time in america where the stigma attached to sex and sex work may lift i actually think a lot of it needs to come from men um, yeah. Because, you know, and and so I really want to hear you talk uh, about that and what you think, either you know what you experience with your clients or men in general, how you think they can really change this around. Because I think women have done as pretty much as you know as much as we can do, and we need guys to call other guys out. We need other guys to step up and start changing and be better. Right. And how do you think they can right. do that? Right. Right. Well, you, yeah, you, you go right, you drill right down to the heart of it. I mean, I, I always kind of return to first principles around this, which is that people want sex. Men want sex. Women want. But let's just talk about men. Those are or clients. Men they want sex, right? And they want right. sex throughout their lives, right? It's not just one day they want it. I mean, they want it. They want to have sex. They want to have sex with other people, and they want to have sex that feels hot and fulfilling. Um, yeah. They want the sex. To, you know, it, this is not just like rudimentary, you know, it's not, it's not just being like, you know, like a biological function, like a sneeze. They, they want build up. They want, you know, sometimes you want sex to have love attached to it. But what we've done is what we've done in our culture is we've, we've attached 
sex to love, right? We've said that sex and love have to go together and that, you know, that means having sex with one person and all this stuff, right? All of this kind mm -hmm. of kind of marrying sex to partnership and love and all these things. Um, and that's the, that's sort of the accepted sex that people can have. And then we demonize a whole bunch of other kinds of sex, including masturbation, including, you know, jerking off to porn or, you know, going and seeing a sex worker, um, having sex outside of marriage. Um, having sex with somebody other than your spouse, um, so all of that, all of that other kind of extracurricular um, curricular sex um, is, is considered to be much more problematic. You know, kind of pulling all of these pieces apart and, and and taking all of this apart and just saying like, if you want to have sex, then have sex. Don't be a jerk about it. Okay, that's really your responsibility to not be a jerk about it. It's fine for you to want sex, and you may not be able to get the people that you want to have sex with you for free. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have to pay for it, but that doesn't make you a jerk. It doesn't make you a bad guy. It doesn't make you a loser. Um, right. it, it just means that you have to pay. You just have to go and get it like a, it's a service. It's like I, I don't have anybody right. in my life okay. who paint my toes for free. I have to go and pay someone to do that. I don't feel like an asshole sure. for it. Um, right. You know, I, okay. I, I pay so, the nice lady who's, who does that. Okay. So accountability. Absolutely. I guess, um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is – um, since the sense of power, you know, wanting to be in control and having a sense mm -hmm. of entitlement over women, I think it gets in men uh, deep and early. They get early. those messages. Yeah. yeah I mean, you early. see it in teenage boys very quickly and, and yeah. just, uh, it's, it's a dominant sort of attitude. And so in, in your book, you do talk a lot about boundaries, your boundaries yeah. as an as a individual, as a sex worker, um, as well as client boundaries. But there is something in men. They're always pushing those boundaries, not just with women, but mm -hmm. in every aspect of their lives, you know, physically, at, you know, in, mm -hmm. in taking adventures in their careers. The thing is, when it's with a, another person, especially with women, there's really, you know, pushing a boundary. There has to be, they kind of throw respect out, out the window. And I guess mm -hmm. I'm trying to have you give some sort of insight into how men can change that. Because it seems to be mm -hmm. a, a deep thinking pattern and an attitude in mm -hmm. general that drives this sort of perverted need to kind of twist sex up and around women and we're we're less than we're we're okay it's okay to abuse us and to treat us badly and get away with it and still think you're right. a big hot shot right so how does right how do men go about really sort of turning that around and just basically become decent people <laughs> oh gosh thanks diane for tasking me with that this morning my goodness that's a big one well I, i'm being facetious uh well i mean i would just hear i would hope that any man hearing what you just outlined you know like you say if you know, let's stop and give you pause for a moment. Like, if, if this is if this is how if this is how women report, if this is how the sex worker in your life is reporting that you know that some of these sexual exchanges feel like, you know, maybe some self -re reflection is needed. Um, maybe some some empathy is needed. Um, Why is that so know, hard for men? That seems it, it seems like well, such a difficult thing. It seems simple for us, but a difficult thing for so many men. I don't know. I mean, I I think that women are taught. Again, females, young girls are taught from a very young age. We're 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 taught to pay attention more to what other people think. We're uh, I mean that's baked into, that is just baked into the culture that um, uh, there are more consequences for our actions. So we need to be careful that we aren't as safe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean right. this is this is deep conditional programming. Um, right. And I mean I mean to kind of go back again. I'd always try and kind of go back to something basic and kind of simple. Is just to say, look, if you want to have sex with somebody, and you're going to pay. For, if you have a sexual experience, you want to pay for it. You know, just kind of fundamentally, you know, just first principles: don't be a jerk. Don't, you know, you're dealing with another human being. That person is there to serve you. Yes, there. That person is there to make you feel good. Yes, but you, you never lose sight of that. Is a fully fledged human being. Um, right. With her own needs, her own her own wants, and her own limits. Um, right. And and uh, I mean, 
you know, the idea that you pay for something that means you can just do whatever in the hell you want. I mean, that doesn't take place in any other exchange anywhere. I can't go to a department store and be like, no, take up your clothes and run around naked. I mean, you, you, right. go, you know, there's a limit to every exchange. Right. Um, but it's, oh, it's, okay. I, I mean, I get it intuitively. I, I understand instinctively why that's difficult in a sexual exchange. Well, what we really want is abandoned, to be completely turned on, to, you know, like really fly, right? It's hard, you know? But to even just be thinking about it as, as something that's important to you as a human being, I think, is a start. Okay. All right. So dealing with that, that kind of attitude, honestly, not just in sex work, but when and uh, get that everywhere. It's really exhausting. And you do talk about burnout in the in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so how, because that is really a lot to handle, even if you are being well compensated for it. So mm-hmm. how do yeah. you uh, suggest people go about uh, dealing with, with, well, burnout and uh, dealing with boundaries, other people's, men, women's, let's, let's make this specific. Um, how do women, not only in the sex work in industry, but anywhere, deal with men sort of continually crossing over boundaries and, uh, you know, sort of forcing them in a state of burnout. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I, I, one thing that's nice about what can be nice about the sex industry, certainly, I mean, certainly this isn't true for everyone. It's not true for everyone all the time, is, mm-hmm. is that you, there can be a fair amount of assertive boundary setting right up front, right? Like it's different than dating. It's different than you know, interacting with your boss where you can say, look, I've got some pretty strict boundaries. Like you don't text me after 10 p.m. You, uh, I don't, these are certain names I don't want to be called. Um, you know, I charge yeah. this much and, and, you know, so, so there's already sort of built into it. There's a certain kind of structure. Now, obviously when you're running a small business, customer service is important. Obviously you can't, there are maybe some people who can go through life you know, just asserting boundaries. And I don't know, those are probably dominatrixes, right? That's all they do is assert boundaries. Um, Part of the game. Um, But one of the things that I think that that each individual sex worker can work on and it's it's important work to be done for themselves is knowing what your boundaries are Mm -hmm. and knowing how it makes you feel if those boundaries get crossed and taking care of yourself around it. and, and um, you know, the jerks are always going to be a part of this business. There's no, there's no way to avoid them completely, right? Even a even right. decent client that you've had for years and years and years can still say something yeah. jerky or stand That's you true. up or, you know, whatever these, these things true. do. You know, you're never going to avoid that. And so, mm-hmm. so um, I, uh, my focus always in the book is, 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 is to get clear on what your boundaries are, to give some scripts around how to assert them gracefully uh, if they okay. do get transgressed to give people permission to act on that because that's another thing I think as women is, is that <laughs> and I certainly know this is more true when I was younger was I would feel an internal boundary being crossed and I'd feel it and it would feel icky and then I was just socialized to just kind of swallow it all right right um, right rather than saying okay now is an opportunity for me to say okay this I don't like the direction this is going I want this okay. to stop uh, and how to redirect, how to how to how to uh, move energy in different directions. Those are all really important skills. And then to take care of yourself after the fact. If you've been slimed, if you've been stood up, if you've been if you've been humiliated in some way, how to take care of yourself after the fact. Because right. again, there's no way to avoid it altogether. The best thing to do is is really be committed to taking care of yourself when something mm-hmm. bad does happen. Okay. All right. That's good. So in the book, you mentioned uh, you have a lot of tips for uh, sex workers if they have to uh, deal, end up dealing with the police. What yeah. I get a lot uh, is clients worried about yeah. being ensnared themselves. I yeah, personally, yeah, sure. with the laws, I think they're on the client's side. So it's definitely, the, the clients really don't have to worry in most states the way the laws are set up. So can you explain more of that? Because I have not had a lot of experience with that. But if if you have, um, uh-huh. you know, how do you, in, from the client's perspective, how they can, you know, what you think they should or should not worry about? In that uh, you know what, I, this, this particular question doesn't make me really comfortable. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Oh, I never okay. had to deal with, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll give you my answer. I never had to deal I, of course, I was very fortunate. I never, I was never personally arrested. Um, I had, uh, I, I know I had several friends who were back in 
uh, San Francisco when I was working, I was away for several years. And during that time, and a whole slew of women that I knew got systematically busted. Um, I just happened to be out of it for that window of time. And I, I mean, I could have very easily been, been uh, one of the, one of the people who was rounded up in that sting. For the purposes mm-hmm. of the book, I went and spoke to lawyers. I have several ex police officers in my, in my broader social circle. So those are the people that I relied on. To, uh, for, you know, I got all the information I could online. Um, but all of that information is pretty secondhand. As I write it, I do mention in the book, so much of the issue, at least in the United States, so much, the laws are so local and the, the way that the laws are enforced are so local. Um, uh-huh. And that can switch from you know administration to administration. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying completely. I always, what I, I used to say to my clients, look, I'm out here every day doing this. And I haven't been busted right. yet, and you want to come and see me one, right? right? The odds are a lot better that I'm going to get busted than you're going to get busted, and I'm still out here doing this. Um, right. Yeah, today might be the day we both get unlucky, but, you know, give me, oh, I mean, really, on some levels, like, give me a break, dude. <laughs> I mean, really, yes, exactly. I'm out here exactly. advertising that I'm doing this, and you're <laughs> answering an ad. I mean, yeah, I mean, there is this. It is this the 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 level of exposure is like a thousand to one. But I understand nobody wants to get busted. I get that. I mean, I get it one one hundred percent. But I just again, there's sort of like a a sense of entitlement, a sense of like, well, I've got you know a lot to lose. You know, how can you make me feel better about this? Well, it's like I'm out here risking myself, so that's what I'm doing. What are you doing for me to keep me safe? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) How can you guarantee that for me? Yeah, exactly. That is so true. That is so true. So thank you. Thank you for making that point. That's great. Sure. So sure. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just, uh, this is uh, one last question, but it's, I found it absolutely fascinating because there's a, a certain story in the book that you uh, talk about. Let me, let me read, let me quote what you say here. And then I would love to hear your idea on this. So we know that sure. you uh, did work uh, in strip clubs. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, yeah, and so here is the the story that you talk about uh, at one of the strip clubs you worked at. So, uh, and I quote, it says, The booth was the jungle. So many lines of power were on display there. Desire, aggression, resentment, greed, domination, menace. Many lusties would never go near it. It was more than a little nuts to be locked in a plastic box, enticing strangers to pay to watch them masturbate. I loved it, though, and I was a good earner. Management scheduled me every Saturday to work the longest and most grueling shift on the lusty calendar, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Six hours of facing drunken hordes spilling out of the surrounding North Beach nightclubs, cruising for a thrill. Sides of myself I didn't even know I possessed would show up on those nights as packs of men strolled by my window, stopping to leer and jeer, ordering me to show them my ass. I, I gotta say, I have never read anything quite like that. And we, these places are not places I, I frequent and I have not worked in a, mm-hmm. in a strip club. But, you know, my, so my experience, as I think a lot of people in, in the culture, are, we get it from movies. That, it just struck me though, because you also make the point in the book that you're not a naturally confrontational person. And that's certainly been my experience of you through the times that we I've interviewed you. So what you've described here, I found absolutely fascinating because I could, in my imagination, put myself in that position and yeah. definitely not feel what you felt there. It was like this, this, this animal, this powerful animal would rise up in you when you were put in that box. So please, if you could uh, maybe expand on that and tell, tell us what you were, you know, what was happening there. I love it. Well, I appreciate you <laughs> highlighting that particular story because it actually made me realize that I, I, you know, it was, it was unique to that set of circumstances. I never felt it before. And to be really honest, I've never really felt it again. I mean, it, um, so it, this business, you know, the strip club was set up in order to put me on display and to have hundreds, if maybe not, I mean, on a given night, maybe thousands of men come through the, the, the strip club, you know, and there I was, everybody else was behind a peep show window, right? You had to put money in and to see, you know, like you had to, but I was the only one that everyone could look at, um, unless I was busy, then I would shut my window and then, and then, you know, there'd be somebody in my private booth, but, you know, then I'd open up the window again and I'd be the one that was on full display. 
So it what was it? Yeah, but what was it about that particular environment that kind of brought out the beast in you? I'm just really curious about that. I I guess it was just that the 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 response was so immediate, right? I mean, so so, to a certain extent, what you were talking about with that 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 dynamic that happens on the street, right? When when a guy Mm -hmm. sees a really attractive woman and and his his look is so overpowering right and mm-hmm. and women mm-hmm. feel it women know what that feels like right to have you know and right. of course what goes through your mind is there's there might be on some level some some feeling of like you know there's fear right you don't know if this guy is right. safe right you might right. on some level be a little bit flattered there might be some of that but generally that's overridden by the feelings of fear or disgust or not feeling right. safe um right well here i was i was in this box where i was safe right i was not i was physically uh, physically, the men could not get to me. Second of all, I had the management that was there, right? So at any given time, I could, you know, get anybody bounced that I needed to. There was, you know, even if somebody was harassing me, that I could, I, I was always the one that was in charge. So all of a sudden, I was that chick on the street corner who could say anything and do anything, and the consequences mm. were compl- were very, very different. Um, we're out on the street, you, you might have somebody yelling at you or following you or right. whatever there can be like some really negative consequences all of a sudden i was the one that was in power i was the one right. that was in charge and so yeah it was it was a, a a very different headspace to be in where i was dressed in my lingerie like people could judge me they could see if they liked it or they didn't like it um mm-hmm. and of course there was i got to watch the dynamic of the men the way that they would interact because they're sexually turned on they or they want to be more turned on but they're also mm-hmm. kind of and they're they're not in their element right so they're and they're and they're you know how guys get when they've got home <laughs> packs of guys when they're, they kind of they have they're slightly sexually aroused and they want to be more aroused it, 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 all of their <laughs> emotional stuff comes up or they feel vulnerable yeah. they feel you know, angry yeah. maybe, they, they feel competitive. Yeah. Like there's a lot, like, so all that male jockeying is going on. So I kind of got to watch that close up. That was kind of like a sociological experiment, um, watching the way that men would interact when they would walk into a strip club and they'd want to have hard-ons and they'd want to have orgasms. And like, how do they get right. that without, you know, being feeling weird about it? Um, right. So yeah, it, it was, I mean, I say about the sex industry, one of the things, that, you know, one of the points that I make in the book is, is that the sex industry is by its nature disorienting. It's mm. it's overstimulation uh, because we're because our job is to turn people on, right? And we don't right. go through life most of the time getting just turned on, right? <laughs> you go to the supermarket, right. you know, getting sexually aroused isn't part of that experience. So it it is very unsettling for people. Um, and uh, I found it I found it infinitely infinitely fascinating. But like I say, that particular setup was was designed so that for the first time in my life i'm a chick standing on the street corner getting ogled but i have all the power no one can harm me mm. no one can touch me so yes I, I felt i did feel that very liberating there was a i felt ferocious at times um, cruel at times um yeah i definitely mm. worked some shit out i would say <laughs> 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 you know i'm definitely you know i right. did for sure. Well, that was uh, okay. Well, that was awesome. Um, I do have to run here, but um, mm-hmm. this has been again, once again, this has been very interesting. And uh, so I look forward to you know your your book. There it is on. I've got a page dedicated dedicated to it on my site, and uh, I thank will continue you. to oh, promote it. And, Great. And help. You I really way. appreciate that so much. And, sure. I, and you know what? I have more. I have more stuff coming down the pike. The the pike. I have a. I have a, a a workbook that uh, fingers crossed will be out in time for Christmas, but if not, it'll be out, it'll be out in the first uh, quarter of, of 2018. Um, mm-hmm. Because uh, I, I, my hope is, is to, to really help uh, sex workers focus on uh, their business and and how they how they market themselves and things like that. So I have a workbook coming out soon and an audio book. I'm hoping in the second half of the year. So hopefully you'll have me back on to talk about those things once once I once I release them. Great. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll develop a video course too. <laughs> I know you're, that's what you, <laughs> I've got to think about that. I've got I, I, I to think about how that might, might work. Maybe you and I could discuss that at some point, what your thoughts are. Anyway, it's always great to yeah. talk to you, Diana. Thank you so much for what you're doing because uh, tackling the client side of it is really important and, and uh, very few people are doing it. So I admire mm. you and I appreciate you. Thank you. And likewise. <laughs> <laughs>
have a great day. Thank you, Lois, so much. Yeah, you too. Bye Thank you. This is your host, Diane Bridges, and you've been listening to The Body House Chronicles.